and today's uh, lecture i mean today's discussion session is on the concept of stress and my name is rajiv mukherjee i am hosting this uh, live sessions so let us start <clears throat> so this is the course outline as i have already discussed in the previous uh, live sessions so we have already covered three weeks worth of content and now for the fourth week uh, the, the topic is concept of stress and uh, this is the live interactive session today is 17th august 2024 and this is a live session uh, i mean link to join the live session and this live session is uh, held at <clears throat> 4 pm to 6 pm every saturday and for your information the recording of the live session and the uh, i mean the presentations lecture materials whatever it is already shared in a common folder and you can find the recordings and the lecture materials from the problem solving session which appears in your dashboard of the course <clears throat> so you can check anytime i upload uh, the videos recording videos weekly so you can also access the previous uh, lectures or live discussion sessions if you have missed okay so <clears throat> about the summary of week four so in week four we delved into the concepts of stress and talking about stress there was also information about uh, surface forces body forces especially traction then the concept of scalar vector and tensor that are equally important for understanding how the stress tensor evolves uh, then we talked about stress on a surface or a stress on a plane and stress at a point and from the concept of stress at a point we uh, discussed about the stress equilibrium conditions then uh, we derived the mathematical expressions for principal axis of stresses and from that principal axis of stresses we defined the concept of stress ellipse uh, in two dimension and then stress ellipsoid in three dimension then we also discussed about uh, the stress matrices that is the stress tensor and its normal and shear stress components and then we also learned about the stress invariants the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and how they are used to calculate the different components of stresses and uh, uh, correlating them with the deformation <clears throat> and then we also derived some mathematical expressions for stress components on a plane and determining the principal stress components and then we also talked about the conjugate shear planes relation between stress and stress so uh, today's topic of discussion is actually solving some conceptual problems uh, related to uh, not exactly strain and deformation there will be strain deformation and stress okay so and then we will summarize and conclude today's discussion session and also we will briefly talk about uh, the plan for upcoming live session <clears throat> so today we will be solving only the uh, conceptual problems in mcq questions where we will not discuss any further theories because i think that the, the course material for the concept of stress is pretty elaborate and there are almost all information you need to learn about stress which are particularly applicable for uh, structural geology so let us start with today's uh, uh, MCQ questions. And today's session would be a brief and concise, concise uh, exercise. We have 14 to 15 questions, which uh, almost covers uh, every aspect of stress. OK, so the first question is, shear stresses on any two perpendicular planes in a body under stress is? Option A, unequal in magnitude but of same sign. Option B is unequal in magnitude but and of opposite sign. <clears throat> Option C is equal in magnitude but of opposite sign. Option D is equal in magnitude and of equal sign. 
so sheer stress is whenever whenever you're talking about uh, two perpendicular planes in a uh, body under stress that means we are talking about the surface forces now when we are talking about surface forces you should keep in mind that shear stresses are generally <clears throat> they are produced as resolved components of the main force that has been applied on the surface so in this case for understanding the equilibrium condition so whenever we talk about the equilibrium condition so in equilibrium condition we generally define that condition based on the stress at a point but before <clears throat> deriving the uh, expressions for strain uh, stress equilibrium we define these components for a uh, representative volume representative volume uh, around that particular point and uh, we um, calculate the different components of the forces that act on the surfaces that encloses the volume okay so if i draw a schematic diagram so let us say we have a cube and these are the coordinate axis partition coordinate axis x2 x1 sorry x3 and x1 okay so somewhere inside this cube enclosed is a point p so the equilibrium condition is defined based on the calculations for stress at a point okay so <clears throat> the equilibrium condition <clears throat> the stress equilibrium condition essentially dictates two primary conditions that are no translation and no rotation so these are the two primary conditions that we need to fulfill if we say that the body is at an equilibrium for its stress okay. so <clears throat> and as you know that <clears throat> stress is a reaction force okay so that means each of this plane would contain a normal force which are perpendicular to the plane and on the on the plane itself there will be two horizontal components so how 
do you determine the direction of these horizontal components that is very simple you will just follow the direction of the coordinate axis the direction it is pointing from the origin so if somewhere here it is the origin so this is the origin so from origin these three axes have their own directions so the normal force component or the normal stress component it will always be parallel to the axis for a particular plane and the other two components that is the shear stress components they will always be perpendicular to the axis axis of concern for the plane we are talking about but they will also lie on the plane these shear components so for sigma 1 sorry for the coordinate axis sigma uh, x1 the normal stress component would be sigma 11 right and if you consider this point as the origin of the stresses for this plane right so this is what plane so this plane is basically x2 x3 plane this plane is x1 x3 plane and this plane is x1 x2 plane right so see if we consider that this is the point on the x1 x2 x3 plane from where the stress is being resolved and we have all already known that this stress is sigma 11 and since this stress is resolving from the plane x1 i mean it is uh, a plane perpendicular to x1 that means this direction will be originating from sigma uh, 1 and it is pointing towards x2 so if i say sigma 11 what does what does it mean so there are two one this is called the index notation so what is the index not index notation means it means <clears throat> the first letter represents the <clears throat> area vector of the plane the second letter represents the direction of the stress right so for sigma 1 1 it would mean the first one would mean that the plane we are talking about has an area vector or normal vector which is parallel to x1 so that is why 1 and the second one means the stress but the normal stress component is also acting parallel to 1 so that is why it is sigma 1 1 now then if i talk about this component of stress this is a shear stress component so it is tau now since we are taking the tau on this plane which is x to x3 plane x to x3 plane and we know that the normal vector of this plane is parallel to x1 so the first index will be 1 and the second index is 2 because this force i mean this stress 
it is acting parallel to x2 so that is why this is sigma 1 2 sorry tau 1 2 and similarly this component will be tau 1 3 right now if you talk about this plane this plane has a normal vector parallel to x2 so the first index will be 2 that means this component which is acting parallel to x1 will be tau 2 1 and this this uh, stress component which is acting parallel to x3 will be tau 2 3 and of course this one will be sigma 2 2 and similarly this one will be sigma 3 3 since the normal vector of this plane is parallel to x3 now this component of the stress it will be tau 3 2 and this component will be tau 2 3 sorry tau 3 1 correct right? So, shear stress on any two perpendicular planes in a body under stress is, so as you can see, this plane and this plane are perpendicular, right? This plane and this plane, they are perpendicular. Now, in this case the force is directing in this way so if you talk about the component tau 1 3 and this component tau 3 1 so are they equal in magnitude they are equal in magnitude of course they are equal in magnitude but of but are they are of the same sign they are opposite sign exactly so that means in order to maintain the equilibrium condition we have that tau 3 1 will always be equal to tau 1 3 but the direction is opposite so that is how you maintain this no translation and no rotation condition so in this case option c is correct right They are equal but of opposite side. Okay. So let us go to the second question. <clears throat> question number two says the earthquakes in the mid oceanic reach is caused by option A normal faulting, option B strike slip faulting option c high angle reverse faulting and option d opening of the reef at the reach crest so which option do you think strikes a faulting uh, strike slip fault at the mid oceanic reach okay so if you consider the setting of a mid oceanic reach what exactly happens so if this is the lithosphere so a mantle plume or a mantle convection that is coming up so this convection cycle pushing the magma outward Right. So, the push from the magma that creates an opening in the reach. So, if this is a mid oceanic reach, the spreading of this reach it is governed by the push from the magma below. And where the magma is pushing, so the plate is being pushed away from the reach and then it is 
subducted. So the plate is subducted. This is subducted. So <clears throat> this push in the lithosphere at the mid oceanic ridge, this creates an extensional stress regime. The push of the mag of the mantle convection. causes thinning of the lithos lithosphere and it creates an extensional stress regime extensional or tensile stress regime so if we consider so this is a block and we are pulling it so what will happen? They will develop extensional fractures. So if this is sigma 1, minus sigma 1, if you consider this as minus sigma 1. Why? Because in structural geology, we generally consider the compressive stress as positive and the uh, tensile stress or the extensional stress as negative, right? So the push from the mental convection creates this extensional regime so consider this as the lithosphere which has been thinned because of the temperature and now this push from the mental convection this is generating a tensile stress like this so because of the presence of this tensile stress the lithosphere will develop conjugate tensile fractures right so what will happen the next thing that will happen is that these blocks they will move apart they will move away from each other that's how the ridge works and the portion the middle portion it will sag down these blocks will move apart the central portion will sag down, sag SAG down. So what will be the relative movement? So if we consider this as the foot wall, so the hanging wall movement this will go down like this right that means this is a stretch fault or no exactly so this no, is not normal fault so 
so this normal fault generates the space right this normal fault is basically the reason so if this is the reason if this is the cause this is the manifestation option d which is the opening of the rift at the ridge crest so ridge crest is basically a mountain top right a plateau like region and this plateau like region they are pulled apart and the middle portion is always sagging down and <clears throat> once it is sagged down it creates multiple such normal fault like this a system of normal faults they show this kind of pattern and these curved fault surfaces at the ridge basically causes the thinning of the lithosphere and it allows more vigorous partial melting of the lithosphere and eventually the magma ascends to the top and fills the gap at the newly created ridge right so these faults at the ocean surface i mean at the oceanic plate these faults have curved surfaces and these are essentially normal faults so these kind of faults they are generally known as listric faults l i s e r i c listric normal faults due to curved surface it is called listric yes they have the fault plane is essentially curved so and and they generally occur as different i mean multiple fault systems or fault network all together okay they generally occur as this and that is why i mean the name is given as the listric fault listric normal faults so in mid oceanic ridge earthquake that generally take uh, that that occurs they are mostly because of these uh, normal fault things and of course strike slip fault they also occur in uh, any mid oceanic ridge because this is the most simplistic model or explanation behind the generation of a new ridge and uh, rifting of the oceanic plate so this is a very simplistic geometrical model but in reality the things are very much complex and because of the intricate complexity even reverse faults and uh, strike slip faults can also occur but they are not that dominant because primarily because primarily since the mid oceanic ridge it is a uh, tensile stress regime and that is why normal fault is the characteristic structure that we observe in the ridges right such as when we talk about subduction zones or collisional uh, collisional belts or orogenic belts we see truss faults not normal faults but truss faults so that is the characteristic feature of orogenic belts however strike slip faults they generally are not so much i mean popular in within this ridge or subduction zone or any kind of uh, orogenic belt but strike slip faults they occur as transform faults so transform faults are basically the region where a spreading ridge is converted into a subduction subducting lithosphere a spreading lithosphere is converted into a subducting lithosphere so that is a transform fault so transform means it is transforming the stress regime so whenever whenever you talk about normal faults that means we are in the tensile stress regime but whenever we talk about truss faults we are in the compressional stress regime so from being in uh, from being in tensile stress regime to shifting towards a compressive stress regime 
the mechanism that plays in in between these two things is the transform faulting and essentially transform faults are strictly faults so somewhere between the reach and the subduction zone somewhere between here there are several transform faults so if you see the map of the mid oceanic ridge of the mid atlantic ridge you will see that ridge fault ridge fault ridge fault this kind of structure you will observe here so these ridge segments they are generally connected through faults so these faults they are transform faults so sir yeah sir in, uh, in this way we can say that uh, the transform faults act as uh, uh, channel from where the tensile stress is dissipated uh, some part of the tensile stress is dissipated before uh, uh, coming to the compressive stress exactly exactly so this is channel to accommodate the differential stress when shifting from a tensile stress regime to a compressive stress regime so those transform faults they actually accommodate this difference and that is how now the interesting thing, thing is that <coughs> subduction is a destructive process and the mm, mid oceanic ridge creation of the mid oceanic ridge this is a constructive process right? so from uh, being a constructive process to a destructive process so the ultimate goal is to balance the net surface area of the earth so if you talk about the crust and the lithosphere all together the main target is to balance or to keep constant the total surface area so the total surface area of the upper layer of the earth it should not exceeds its current current value it should neither decrease nor increase so that's how creating a ridge and then subducting it through the help of mantle convection and transform fault earth maintains a constant external surface area that is the main uh, reason behind the <clears throat> geodynamics of uh, going from uh, mid oceanic ridge to a subduction zone Uh, one another interesting thing is yes. that uh, yes. in uh, just i have read that in uh, africa there is a huge a fault is uh, in the current period yeah yeah uh, yeah so from uh, if it is expanding then where uh, the consuming uh, consume part will be at that which site so if you see the map of africa you are talking about the east african ridge so the east african ridge is basically an intercontinental reef so that means it is tearing apart the african continent itself so once it is fully exposed on the surface okay. it will it will divide the african continent into two parts two parts so these two continents these are i mean these two i mean the african continent say for example this is the african continent and it has broken apart in two pieces now they are going away from each other right so what is happening in between if these two continent to block continental blocks they move away from each other what is taking place in between the space so that is a newly created oceanic plate right so this rift will originate a new oceanic plate between these two continental blocks so since it is being created at this rift the oceanic plate so where it will consume because the oceanic plates will automatically end where the continental blocks of the african continent will exist right so from say for example this is my ridge and the oceanic plate is starting to grow and it will stop at the very junction where it is touching the western block of the african continent and this side this newly created oceanic plate 
it will stop again at the eastern block of the rifted african continent and then this oceanic plate will subduct below the western african african block and this oceanic plate it will subduct below the eastern african block and that is how the balance will be maintained okay so going to the next question third question in an orogenic belt the principal stress axes are oriented as follows sigma 1 is horizontal orientation is given as east west sigma 2 is horizontal the orientation is given as north south and sigma 3 is vertical such an orientation of stress axis can produce the options are given north south striking thrust faults north south striking gravity faults east west striking thrust faults and east west striking gravity faults so <clears throat> To understand this question, we need to look into the Anderson's classification of faults. So what is the theory behind the Anderson's classification of fault? Say for example, I have a three dimensional axis. So this axis, this and this. So consider this one as sigma one, the maximum normal space. This is sigma three, the minimum normal space and sigma 2 the intermediate normal stress but the this is the maximum principal stress this is the lowest uh, the minimum principal stress and sigma 2 is the intermediate principal stress so we can write it as sigma 1 maximum principal stress sigma 2 is the intermediate principal stress and sigma 3 is the minimum principal stress And the relation generally we follow is that sigma 1 is greater than sigma 2 and greater than sigma 3. Okay? So the theory of Anderson's is that the <clears throat> fracture planes or fault planes will develop The fracture planes or fault planes will develop at an angle of 45 degree forty-five degree to thirty degree thirty degree sorry thirty to forty-five degree with respect to sigma one plane. why is that so because we know that for any plane we have the normal stress value written as sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 cos 2 theta and sigma s or the shear stress it is written as sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 sin 2 theta, right? 
so shear fractures will occur at the maximum value of sigma s right so what what is the maximum value of value of sigma s sigma x max is basically sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 so this is the maximum value of the shear stress that means when sin 2 theta is equal to 1 it is possible only then so when sin 2 theta is 1 when theta is 45 degree that means 2 theta is 90 degree and sin 90 means 1 right so if the planes are oriented at an angle of 45 degree with respect to sigma 1 or at within a range of 30 to 45 degree with respect to the sigma 1 then and only then it will develop the conjugate shear plane so these are basically conjugate shear plane and anderson has taken this theory to understand the dynamics of faulting so anderson basically has said that you need to look for the orientation of the fault planes with respect to sigma 1 sigma 2 and sigma 3 then you can identify the nature of faulting how so so for example you have a block right so in this case you are applying sigma 3 from here and you are applying sigma One from here and sigma two is vertical, right? So in this case, what will happen? No, sorry, sigma two and sigma three are horizontal, sigma one vertical. in this case what will happen the faults will develop like this and since sigma 3 is minimum and sigma 1 is maximum what will happen this block will move right in this direction and this block will move away from this direction okay i mean did you understand what i am saying so since sigma 3 is minimum it will provide minimum resistance towards this block which are fractured so once sigma 1 is vertical the vertical nature of the sigma wall sigma 1 will produce such a force that these two blocks will move away from each other so it will create normal fault like this okay so this is moving away this direction and this is moving away from this direction so when sigma 1 is vertical it will produce normal fault now for the same case so if this is case 1 for case 2 we consider the same block except that from top we are applying sigma 3 from here we are applying sigma 2 and we are applying sigma 1 from here so in this case sigma 1 and sigma 2 they are horizontal sigma 3 is vertical so what will happen the faults will basically be created along this direction right right 
at an angle of 30 to 40 degree with respect to the sigma 1 direction. So since sigma 3 is again at the least resistance, these fractures, what will happen? Now this block, it will move up away, I mean move upwards like this. If you are pushing from this direction and sigma 3 is the least resistance offered by I mean, the tectonic forces, so this block will simply move upwards with respect to this block. So that means it will produce a thrust fault or reverse fault. So whenever sigma 1 is horizontal, sigma 1 and sigma 2 is horizontal, it will produce thrust faults. So this is normal fault. And this will produce thrust faults. Thrust faults or reverse faults. And the finally, say for example, we have a block. We are applying sigma 2 vertically, but sigma 1 and sigma 3 are horizontal. What will happen? Again, we will see two set of fractures have been developed. Two set of fractures develop and what will happen these blocks will move just like this so in this case what will be the structure This will move along this direction, this will move along this direction. So it will produce strike slip right. points. Right. So when this strike slip fault will occur, when sigma 2 is vertical. So according to Anderson's classification, when sigma 1 is vertical, it will produce normal fault. When sigma 3 is vertical, it will produce thrust faults. And when sigma 2 is vertical, it will produce strike slip faults. So now coming to the question, it says it is saying that in an orogenic belt, the principal stress axes are oriented as follows. Sigma 1 is horizontal east-west, sigma 2 is horizontal north-south, and sigma 3 is vertical. So it matches with case number 2, where sigma 3 is vertical, and sigma 1 and sigma 2 both are horizontal. So what kind of fault it will produce? Trust. Trust fault. Now what is the orientation of the fault? So the orientation of the fault will essentially be governed by the orientation of the uh, <clears throat> principal stress axis, principal axis of, uh, I mean, sigma 1, the orientation will be governed by sigma 1. So, the thrust plane, thrust plane will be subparallel to the sigma 1 direction, of course. So, in case of fault, we talk, the, we talk about the orientation of the fault plane, right? So, what will be the strike of the fault plane. So it will be subparallel to sigma 1. So since sigma 1 is trending east-west, in that case, the thrust fall, although it will not be perfectly aligned to east-west, but it will obviously be subparallel to sigma 1. So we can say that fault plane strike will be sub parallel to sigma 1 
So since sigma one has an orientation towards east west, that means option C is correct. That the fault plane will have basically, I mean, the structure it will produce is east west striking thrust faults. Okay, so this is an important theory, and I urge you to look into this Anderson's fault uh, classification of faults in more detail. I have just discussed the mechanism, how it is taking place, and what are the three variations. But of course, even in theory, you will learn, learn in detail and what are the other tectonic implications for applying the Anderson's classification. Okay, going to the next question. The ratio of axial stress to corresponding axial strain for elastic material is known as option A bulk modulus, option B Poisson's ratio, option C shear modulus, and option D Young's modulus. So I know that uh, you have just started the week four's content, uh, sorry, week five's content that is the rheology in this, in, and in rheology, you will of course learn about different kind of modulus and the relation. But since we are, since we already have started, I mean, learned about stress, so we will also look for some questions where we can relate the stress with the strain. Right? And in this case, if we observe a stress strain curve of a deforming object, stress is sigma. And strain is generally written using epsilon. So if you observe a stress strain curve, we see that the curve goes like this. So interesting point is that in the stress strain curve, we will have a linear segment. And then we will have Nonlinear segment. So this nonlinear segment of the stress strain curve it defines the plastic deformation of the material. Nonlinear segment of a stress strain curve. defines the plastic deformation of the material. And then there is a linear segment. So the linear segment of the stress strain curve defines the elastic deformation of the material. So in this elastic regime, the <clears throat> stress is linearly proportional to Linearly proportional to the strain, and this is known as the Hooke's law. So Robert Hooke would first define the concept of elasticity, and he he determined that any object which deforms or show, shows a considerable or visual 
which is a visual uh, deformation they generally are uh, they generally follow the rule where the stress is linearly proportional to the strain and for axial strain means say for example this is this is a spring right so you compress it along the axis of the spring and it will get shortened so we are deforming the spring so this is the axial strain and the applied load is the axial stress right so according to hooke's law sigma is proportional to epsilon and for axial uh, put a constant e so e is basically epsilon sorry sigma by epsilon that means if epsilon is equal to 1 then e is equal to sigma which means the amount of amount of stress required to generate or the amount of axial stress required to generate unit amount of axial strain that is the constant of the material that defines the elasticity of the material and this constant is known as the young's modulus so option d is correct because we are talking about axial strain and axial stress and for elastic material elastic material means the material has not yet crossed its elastic limit and went for a plastic deformation that means the stress and strain they are linear to each other and the slope of this curve linear curve is basically the young's modulus and young's modulus is denoted using e okay so let us go to the next question so the question says that during an earthquake if the shear wave velocity and density are measured as 3 3600 meter per second and density of 2. 7 g per cc respectively what would be the elastic modulus of the rock rock body assuming a poisson's ratio of 0.25 now <clears throat> first of all discuss what is poisson's ratio so whenever say for example we have say a cylinder so if we try to deform it or compress it like this by applying axial stress after a certain deformation we will see that the cylinder has turned into a barrel shape because when it is deforming in this direction to keep the volume constant it has expanded along this direction so this is axial strain and this is the transverse strain so poisson's ratio is defined as a negative quantity of the expression of the transverse strain by axial strain 
or it can also be represented as simply the longitudinal strain divided by the longitudinal strain okay so that means poisson's ratio of 0.25 this means that the material we are talking about has the ability to be, uh, have the material is able to have 25% less deformation along its lateral direction compared to its longitudinal direction so if this is sigma x sorry sorry not sigma x so if this is epsilon x and this is epsilon this is epsilon z and that means epsilon z by epsilon x is 0.25 so epsilon z is basically 1/4 of epsilon x so that means a poisson ratio of 0.25 means the material is able to have 25% less deform i mean 1/4 <clears throat> i mean the material will be able to deform one fourth of its longitudinal strain in the lateral direction so that is it okay. it means it 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 we can say that uh, uh, transverse strain is one fourth of the axial strain yes the transverse strain is one fourth of the axial strain so that is the meaning of the poisson ratio of 0.25 so that means the strain is different the property is different along lateral direction compared to its axial direction that is why uh, it, 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 it is uh, showing uh, this kind of uh, poisson ratio okay so now the poisson ratio has been related i mean poisson's ratio of a material is a linking parameter that can link between several other characteristic constants of a material so i can write it this way poisson's ratio is a is kind of a linking parameter that connects one mechanical property to another say for example if we have mu as the rigidity modulus rigidity modulus or the shear modulus so what is rigidity modulus and or shear modulus so as per definition this is the resistance of a material against shear deformation okay so
this mu is related to the young's modulus that we just discussed previously or the elastic modulus to this equation mu is equal to e by 2 plus 1 2 by uh, i mean mu is equal to e divided by 2 into 1 plus mu this is the real change and the velocity of shear wave Vs, this is related to the rigidity modulus as per this formula, where rho is the density of the material. Now, of course, mu will be Vs square multiplied by rho. And if we just substitute this value in this equation, we get Young's modulus or the elastic modulus is equal to V A square rho to V S square rho multiplied by 1 plus mu. Okay. So we have the values here. V S is 3600 meter per second. And rho is 2.7 gram per cc. If we convert it to SI from CGS to SI, that will be 2700, 2700 kg per meter cube. This is the formula. Sorry, not the formula. This is the values for V and rho. Then if we just simply put it here, 2 into 3600 square times 2700 into 1 plus 0.25. That means 2.5 multiplied by 3600 square multiplied by 2700. So you can calculate it. You will get the value. So 2.5 times 3600 square times 2700. So the value is 87.48 10 to the power 9 Pascal. So then if we just simply divide the number by 10 to the power 9, we will get 87.48 gigapascal GPA. So the value of the elastic modulus will be 87.48. That means option D is correct. Okay. So you just have to use this formula. E is equal to 2 v square rho multiplied by 1 plus mu. Okay. Okay, sir. Hmm. So going to the next question, the stereographic projection, stereographic projection below shows the principal stress axis and the fault planes. The projection represents option A, reverse fault, option B, dextral fault, option C, sinistral fault, option D, normal fault. So this stereogram, if you see, These are the fault planes. Right? That means one fault is dipping towards west, another is dipping towards east. 
so in which case fault planes deep away from each other so this plane is dipping towards east this plane is dipping towards west it will only be possible when sigma 1 is vertical and these blocks are normal dipping away each other so that means this will be normal fault and it is also given here sigma 2 is horizontal sigma 3 is horizontal and sigma 1 is vertical right so according to anderson's fault classification since sigma 1 is vertical this will be a normal fault so the stereograms for normal fault will be like this for thrust fault x thing will be vertical exactly sigma 3 will be vertical sigma 2 and sigma 1 and for strike slip fault the planes are generally perpendicular planes and in this case sigma 3 will be vertical sorry sigma 2 will be vertical sigma 1 and sigma 3 will be horizontal so these are the stereographic representation of three different kinds of faults and their mutual orientation with respect to the principal axis of stresses okay so option d is correct this is a normal fault okay so let's go to the next question <clears throat> a strain ellipsoid of a deformed rock has the principal axis of strain identified as a b and c the stress ellipsoid for the same rock mass has been has the principal axis of stresses as p q and r which of the following option is correct in terms of stress and strain given that a is greater than b is greater than c and p is greater than q which is greater than r option a is a correlates to p b correlates to q and c correlates to r option b is a correlates to q b correlates to p and c correlates to r option c is a correlates to r b correlates to q and c correlates to p and option d is a correlates to q b correlates to r and c correlates to p so first let us draw these two strain ellipsoids okay? so i am not specifically saying whether this is an oblate or collet ellipsoid just two different strain uh, ellipses if one is the strain ellipse then the other will be the stress ellipse okay so consider this as a strain stress ellipse so 
of course the maximum will be sigma 1 and the minimum will be sigma 3 right and for strain ellipse maximum will be lambda 1 and the minimum will be lambda 3 sorry okay so now this is p this is r this is a and this is c so lambda 1 is the or a it is lambda 1 direction of maximum stretch b lambda 2 direction of intermediate stretch and c is lambda 3 direction of minimum stretch or maximum shortening right direction of maximum stretch means minimum shortening and direction of minimum stretch means maximum shortening so for a marker so this is a strain marker which is circular you apply stress like this and then it is deformed to a shape like this so this is the maximum compression direction and this is the minimum compression direction right only when you get maximum compression you get maximum shortening and minimum co compression will create minimum shortening so we can write maximum compression creates maximum shortening and minimum compression creates maximum stretching so minimum maximum compression will always be parallel to maximum shortening and minimum uh, compression will always be parallel to maximum stretching so which is maximum stretches a and minimum short uh, minimum compression is which one r r so and again <coughs> maximum shortening is related to maximum compression that means p, p is so a correlates to r c c r a correlates to r that means minimum shortening sorry a means maximum shortening right and r means minimum compression so a which is maximum stretching correlates to minimum shortening or minimum compression and c which is maximum shortening that correlates to maximum compression right? a which is maximum stretching 
that correlates to minimum compression and c which is which which is basically the maximum shortening that correlates with the maximum compression so a correlates to r and c correlates to p that means option c is correct right a correlates to r b correlates to q and c correlates to p okay so option c is the correct answer so this is how a stress ellipse can be related to strain ellipse okay <clears throat> Next question says two sets of joints nearly at right angle to one another produced by the same stress systems are called A joint set, B normal joints, C cross joints, and D conjugate joints. So, as I have discussed in the Anderson's classification, so if this is sigma 1 and this is sigma 3. The maximum shear stress will generate at an angle 45 degree with respect to the sigma 1 direction. So that means if this is joint plane 1 and if this is joint plane 2, they will have an angle of 90 degree between each other. So joint plane 1 will be like this. And joint plane 2 will be like this, having an angle of 90 degree in between each other. And if two sets of joints or two set, sets of shear factors are being produced at an angle of 45 degree with respect to sigma 1, then these planes are called conjugate shear plane, conjugate fractures or conjugate shear planes. Okay? If two shear if two shear planes develop at an angle of forty five degree with respect to the sigma one, then this plane are mutually perpendicular to each other. And they are called conjugate joint plates. So option D is correct. It is important to note that it is written as they are produced by the same stress system. Joints can go joints are essentially extensional features and during exhumation of a rock multiple sets of joint can occur but those joint sets does not necessarily produce because of the same stress system they can be during different episodes and different stress regimes but if two sets of joints are being produced really for a uh, from a same stress system that would essentially be producing conjugate joint lines. Sir, uh, one, one question is there. In the hmm. field, if two conjugate sets are there, so we, we can assume that this, they are produced from same stress system. Conjugate sets are, yes. Conjugates, conjugate joints, if you see in the field, they are essentially produced from the same stress system. Because they will be always there in two sets. In, in field, you will say that they, they are prominently occurring everywhere in this conjugate form. Yes. 
ओके सो क्वेश्चन नंबर नाइन शॉर्टेनिंग ऑफ द अर्थ अपर क्रस्ट इज एकोमोडेटेड बाय ऑप्शन ए फोल्ड्स एंड जॉइंट्स ऑप्शन बी नॉर्मल एंड रिवर्स फॉल्ट्स ऑप्शन सी फोल्ड्स एंड रिवर्स फॉल्ट्स एंड ऑप्शन डी फोल्ड्स एंड नॉर्मल फॉल्ट्स फोल्ड्स एंड रिवर्स फॉल्ट्स एग्जैक्टली सो रिवर्स फॉल्ट इज reverse fall produces shortening and folds are the signatures of ductile deformation so the deformation of the upper crust is essentially brittle ductile in nature so in this case brittle deformation is mainly found in the form of reverse faults reverse or thrust faults and ductile deformation is essentially through folds so that is why in crustal scale we see crustal scale we observe fold thrust belts FTVs are important signatures of <coughs> orogenic uh, belts. The fold thrust belts generally occur in orogenic orogenic belts, and essentially these kind of folds are more likely to be produced because of uh, the gravity than ductile deformation. However, these folds have distinct patterns by themselves and uh one of the example of active fold thrust belts in the world currently is zagros fold thrust belt in the middle east so zagros fold thrust belt is part of the eastern european fold thrust belts in the middle east portion and this is currently active i mean the mountains in the fold thrust belt they are growing and they are folding and thrusting as well so the tectonics is still going on okay question number 10 a uh, horizontal plane experiences a normal stress and shear stress of 40 mp and 20 mp respectively if the plane is inclined 30 degree then calculate the resolved number normal stress and shear stress component on the plane so what is saying is that for example i have a plane and the normal stress acting along this direction is 40 mp and the shear stress is 20 mp now you can easily com compare this with sorry you can easily compare this with sigma 1 and sigma 3 so this is 40 and this is 
Sigma 3 is minimum stress. So the plane is now inclined at an angle of 30 degrees. Therefore, we can use the formula as sigma L, which is sigma 1 plus sigma 3 by 2 plus sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 cos 2 theta and tau, that is sigma 1 minus sigma 3 by 2 into sine. Two theta. Right? So sigma one plus sigma three by two will be thirty MPa, right? and sigma one minus sigma three by two will be ten MPa. So sigma n, that is the normal stress component, will be thirty plus ten into cos. 60 degree, right? Theta is 30 degree, and the tau it will be 10 into sine 60 degree. So, could you calculate the values? So this will be thirty five MP, right? Thirty five sigma, and this one will be. Eighty-six point six zero. Sorry, what? Eighty-six point six zero. Eighty-six. Sine sixty is uh, eight something point eight seven, like something yeah, like eight. that. So eight point seven is close. Eight point seven. Eight point seven. Sorry, sir. Eight point seven MPa. Okay. So the normal stress will be thirty-five megapascal. And the shear stress will be 8.7 megapascal. Okay. So, going to the next question a rock mass has an average density of 2.9 gram per cc. So, we got the first information this is the density. Two point nine gram per cc. That means two nine zero zero kg per meter square. Okay. At a depth of point five kilogram from from the surface, the maximum total horizontal stress is twenty five MPa. The minimum total horizontal stress is fifteen MPa, and the maximum total Vertical stress is 14.2 MPa. Calculate the deviatoric stress experienced by the deforming rock mass. Now, if the deviatoric stress produces a fault, what type of fault would that be? That's the question. So, what is saying is that, say, for example, this is surface. And here is the rock mass. 
and this height is 0.5 kV. Now there is a total vertical force and total horizontal forces from three different directions. Then we have to calculate the davitric space. Right? So what is davitric space? The so davitric stress is mean stress. Uh, uh, sorry, davitric stress is total stress minus the mean stress or even the hydrostatic stress. So if the davitric stress is sigma d, then it will be sigma minus sigma naught. And sigma naught is basically hydrostatic stress rho gh. Okay. So how do we calculate that? So sigma naught will be easy. We have the density rho 2900. G is 9.8 and H is 0 0.5 kilogram, sorry, kilometer means 500 meters, right? So, what will be the value? So, it will be 2900 times. 9.8 times 500. 14210 zero. Simplify divided by 10 to the power 6. We get 14.21. So we get 14.2 megapascal. <clears throat> so this is the mean stress or hydrostatic stress. So we have sigma 1d which is 25 MPa minus 14.2 MPa, right? Which is 10.8 MPa. Sigma 2d that would be 15 MPa minus 14.2 MPa. Okay. It will be 0 0.8 MPa. And sigma 3 is 14.2 MPa minus 14.2 MPa, 0. So as you can see, sigma 3 is 0, sigma 1 is horizontal which is 10.8 MPa and sigma 2 is 0 0.8 MPa which is also horizontal. So according to Anderson's classification, this will produce thrust fault, right? Because sigma 1 is horizontal, sigma 3 is vertical. Sigma 3 vertical means it will always be producing Fast falls or reverse falls. So this is how we did the calculations. Okay. So moving on to the next question. Two planes having attitudes as 04590, 04590 
and 135.90 intersects each other if the value of the maximum intermediate and minimum stress in that region are 45 megapascals 32 megapascals and 18 18 megapascals having a plunge amount of 0 towards 002 90 towards 270 And three towards zero nine seven respectively. Then calculate the maximum shear stress acting on these two plates. Okay, so first let us draw the stereographic projection. The first plane. So, so this is north. This is east. This is south. And this is west. So the first plane is at an angle of zero four five. So this will be a vertical plane. Okay. Another plane will be one third one three five. So one three five means ninety plus forty five. From here, somewhere around here. So the plane will go like this. Very well. These are two intersecting vertical planes. Now that we have given sigma one is forty five MPa, sigma two is thirty two MPa, and sigma three is eighteen MPa. Okay. Having plunge amount of zero towards zero zero two, sigma one has a plunge amount of zero degree towards zero zero two. So zero zero two means it is somewhere here. So sigma one, this is. Sigma two, it is. Ninety degree towards two seven zero. That means the sigma two is essentially vertical since it is plunging vertical ninety degree. So sigma two is vertical. So if this is the case, we are getting sigma one horizontal, sigma two vertical, and then of course. Sigma three is three degree towards zero nine seven, so it is nearly horizontal along east. So it is calculate it is uh, respectively then calculate the maximum shear stress acting on these two planes. So we have to calculate the maximum shear stress acting on this plane. So how do we calculate it? Recall that these planes are making an angle of forty-five degree with respect to uh, with forty-five uh, degree with respect to the sigma one, right? So this is sigma one, and they are making an angle of forty-five degree. They are intersecting with respect to sigma one at an angle of forty-five degree to each other. So it means they are perpendicular. Okay, and we have learned that if two planes are intersecting with respect to sigma one, I mean they are intersecting along sigma one at an angle of forty-five degree with each other, then the maximum shear stress. This will be half times sigma two minus sigma three. If that would be intersecting along sigma two, right? If those planes intersected along sigma two, then the maximum stress, shear stress would be half into sigma one minus sigma three. And if the planes intersected along sigma three, then the shear stress would have been. 
half into sigma one minus sigma two. Okay, so the maximum shear stress in this case it will be half into sigma two minus sigma three. That means half times sigma two is thirty two minus eighteen. That means seven ampere. So this is the maximum shear stress acting on the plane. If uh, uh, planes are intersecting at sigma two, then it will mm. be sigma one minus sigma three, or sigma yes. So this, if this the planes, if the planes would be intersecting along sigma two, then the maximum shear stress would be half into sigma one minus sigma three. This is the condition: sigma one minus sigma three. Yes, yes, we have, but we have, we have done sigma two minus sigma three because the planes are intersecting along sigma one. Right? Sigma one intersection is this one. Oh no! Sorry, sorry, sorry. Exactly, you are you are correct. The planes. So this, this. I mean, the axis of intersection is uh, passing through uh, sigma, sigma two. two. Exactly. Sorry, sorry. So this will be sigma one minus sigma two. So uh, sigma one means this is forty-five uh, minus eighteen. So this is forty five. That means twenty seven MPa by two. Thirteen point five MPa. So the maximum shear stress acting along the plane is thirteen point five into. <clears throat> okay going to the next question if the principal diagonal components of a stress tensor are 12 mpa 10 mpa 6 mpa then calculate the magnitude of the first and the second stress invariants right. so the stress invariant i1 has a formula of sigma 11 Plus sigma two two, plus sigma three three, right? And I two, it has a formula of sigma one one sigma two two, plus sigma two two sigma three three, plus sigma three three sigma one one, minus sigma one two square. Plus sigma two three square, plus sigma three one square. Right. So in this case, we are talking about principal diagonal components. That means, for a stress matrix, there would be sigma one zero 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 sigma two zero and zero zero sigma three. So this is the principal diagonal component. So that means sigma one one, which is equal to sigma one. This is twelve. Sigma two two, which is equal to sigma two. This is ten. And sigma three three, which is sigma three, which is six and two. Right? And sigma one two is equal to sigma two three, 
is equal to sigma 3 1 all are 0 because we are talking about principal diagonal components. So I1 it will be 12 plus 10 plus 6 that means 28. And I2 will be 0. 12 into 10 no uh, I2 cannot be 0 I2 will be only this part this part will be 0 10 into 6 plus 12 into 6. Okay, so this will be 120 plus 60 plus 72. 252. 252. So this will be uh, square of NPA. Unit will be square of NPA. I2. But we generally do not talk about the unit of I2. But if there is a unit, it would be square of the pressure. Now dimensionally, you can see that these are so all square of the pressures and this is also a square term. So essentially it is NPA square or GPA square in that scale. Okay. <clears throat> so for the last question, we have the, again the same problem, a rock mass has an average density of 2.9 gram per cc at a depth of 0.5 kilogram from the surface. The maximum total horizontal stress is 25 MPa. The minimum horizontal stress is 15 MPa, and the total maximum total vertical stress is 14.2 MPa. If sudden fluid injection, if sudden fluid injection into the rock creates an average pore pressure of 8 MPa, calculate the effective stress experienced by the deforming rock mass. So effective stress is basically the deviated stress minus the pore pressure. Right. So in this case, Sigma 1D, as we calculated from the previous problem, the values are same, I guess, 25, 15, and 14.2. The values are same, right? Same, same. Yeah. So for the same value, the, the, these uh, values were 10.8, 0 .8 and 0. So 10.8, sigma 2d, 0.8, and sigma 3d is 0. So now effective stress is denoted as sigma prime. That would be 10.8 minus 8 MPa. So that would be 2.8 MPa. Sigma 2D, sigma prime 2D will be 0 0.8 minus 8 MPa. So that would be minus 7.2 MPa, right? And sigma 3D, this would be minus 8 MPa. So that means in this case of scenario, 
in this hypothetical scenario, the pore pressure changes the compressive regime to a tensile regime. Because you, as you can see, minus 7.2 MPa means a tensile stress. Minus 8 MPa also means tensile stress. Don't you think that minus 7.2 MPa is greater than minus 8 MPa? This sign is essentially meaning that the stress has different symbol or different sign or different direction. So in this case, particularly in this case, sigma 3D, sigma prime 3D is greater than sigma prime 2D. Okay. Because now that we are subtracting the pore pressure, that means pore pressure itself is a tensile stress. It is expanding. Right, so now that we are adding up the pore pressure to the existing uh, condition, the stress regime is changing from compressive to tensile regime, at least for sigma prime 2D and sigma prime 3D. So don't you think that minus 7.2 is greater than minus 8? So this minus sign essentially denotes the sign or the direction of the stress, not the magnitude. Right. Minus 7.2 magnitude of uh, tensile stress means the it is acting opposite to the in uh, it is acting opposite to the general stress condition at that point. So previously, before having an 8 MP of pore pressure, we observed a positive debitric stress that meant the rock was still under a compressive stress regime but whenever the sign is changing from positive to negative that means the rock is no longer in a compressive stress regime it is in an extensional stress regime or a tensile stress regime okay so that's it that's it for today's discussion so in the next discussion in we will talk about rheology specifically Elastic, linear elastic, plastic, viscoelastic, viscoplastic, viscoelastoplastic. So these are different kinds of rheological models. We will uh, see some derivations for these kind of rheological models, and we will do some numerical problems and some uh, conceptual questions regarding fold and buckling and ductile deformation. Okay. So see you in the next class. And for today, I am. Yeah, yeah. Sir, just a simple question. Uh, sir, yes. the, the examination will be conducted in the objective manner or in the subjective manner? In uh, the NPTEL final examination? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it will be just NCQs. NCQ. Okay. Yeah, okay. Thank you then. Joining for today's discussion. I am closing this session. Bye.